Welcome to lesson one. We'll be introducing full stack development. And as you can see, those four icons at the bottom, we have Node.js, Express.js, MongoDB, and Angular. Okay, we'll answer the following questions, like why do we need to learn full stack and introduce the four technology as part of the main stack, right? So, when we say full stack, it means that we have the front end, the back end, and the database working all together, right? Front end is where we usually have the view where the user sees it, right? Um, beautiful designs, you have user interface and user experience. Going to the back end, you would have more of the logics and APIs stored in there. And it's the back end that communicates to the database. Okay. The database is where you store persistent memory, right? So that you don't lose um, any information that you process or you want to store. Okay. So let's go about the brief history first of web development, right? So one of the older stacks, we have the SAM, right? It, it's WAM and MAM. Um, it's basically a stack where you have Apache as your um, server and you have MariaDB or MySQL to use as your database, right? And then you use PHP, Perl, or Python. And the W and M would denote if it's a Windows or M for Mac, right? We have also the NMP, the Nginx, and you that's also a, a server-side technology, right? Um, then you have the database and the language. And with the main stack, you have the database and you also have the frameworks, right? Express, Angular, and Node. Okay, so as we can see now, the full stack developer is no more expanded here, right? The front end deals with the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. That is the language of the web. And the popular frameworks right now we use are React, Vue, Angular, Webpack, and styles. We can do raw HTML, CSS, but we can make beautiful designs with Bootstrap and Material UI, right? Going through from the back end, uh, we have the server side um, frameworks and also languages, right? PHP, Node with JavaScript, and you can also use with TypeScript, Ruby on Rails using Ruby, Java using the Spring framework. ASP.NET that uses um, C Sharp programming language, Redis. Um, it's a caching uh, key value caching uh, in memory. Yep. Um, for the database, you have the relational databases, right? The MySQL, PostgreSQL, the Microsoft SQL, right? MS SQL, the NoSQL, which is um, un um, non relational, right? You have the MongoDB, Cassandra, CouchDB. Elasticsearch, you can throw in uh, Amazon DynamoDB. For a graph, you have the following and message queues. Coming from the dev off sides, uh, this is pretty important now where in the developer uh, manages the uh, operation sites as well, being the infrastructure, right? So you would have the infrastructure with Nginx uh, and AWS, Azure, the ELK stack, um, that's with the uh, Elastic uh, Search um, and something and Kibana, right? Uh, automation, you have the Ansible Chef and Jenkins uh, where you have recipes. So you have the same environment when you need to uh, create a new environment, right? Um, and also for um, CI, CD. So you have continuous integration and um, delivery. So for virtualization, you have the Docker, Kubernetes, and VMwares, right? Uh, mobile app, we also have like Java, the SDK, uh, iOS, we use Swift, right? And other cross-platform like Xamarin and Unity also for game development, okay? So uh, there's a, a big trend towards um, full stack development, right? Um, so you have front-end developers and you have back-end developers, right? Uh, back in the days, um, it's easy to do just front end stuff and back end, but because um, with, with, with the complexity that's being added, because it's becoming more modern, right? 
Now, it really helps if you're a full stack, right? With, let's say, a focus on maybe front end or back end. Why is that? So let's say you're working as a, a full stack with a specialization of front end. But because you're full stack, it means you know how the data would flow and how you would pass the request to the back end, right? The same goes for if you're a back end developer focused as a full stack, right? You would now know which type of request is coming from the front end, right? So that really helps you have a bigger over overview picture, right? I know there's not uh, like, especially enterprise level, it's so hard to have a, like a full stack developer because you really need to have a depth of knowledge. But if you're starting your career or you are in a startup, being a full stack is great because you can build the UI part, which is the front end. You can build the logic back end and the database and have something working, right? Operational. So again, so why full stack development? Gives you um, all the uh, overview, right? And now after you got a taste of the full stack development, then maybe start specializing, okay? Um, for this diagram, it's in the textbook. Um, as you can see, this is the the target uh, application if we're building full stack. I know this course is focusing more on the back end, but if you've gotten through the textbook, what would happen is um, you would see that um, the first top right, there's a picture, right, of a, um, of a user, right, where it interacts with the Express application, right? And it would interact first with Express uh, or Node.js Angular, right? Um, actually, it interacts first with the Express application. It means that even though Express is a server side, right, you might not think it might not generate any views, it can still respond back with a view. So this is the first phase that we're gonna do. We're just using the Express framework and we use the Express to also give the user something to see, right? And then once we are able to iterate that and make it better, we'll also make an Express that only have the API, right? Meaning the, the you can request to the API server and get some data. And through the API, the API would grab the data from the database, right? So Express application is where you interact and the application would send a request to API and API would send a request to the database, right? And then it goes back to the API and to the Express application. If you build the full stack now with adding a front end um, framework, we can replace this Express application with the Angular single page application, okay? And it does the same thing. So advantages and disadvantages, mm, as you see, if you have more knowledge and you can do more, uh, it's basically gonna save more money um, or create your business logic and have more money. <laughs> yep. So, if you're a software engineer, you can associate this as um, being one three, right? And a full stack developer, you are like um, threes in the forest, right? So how many language? Um, monolingual, bilingual, multilingual, it's same as like how we humans talk, right? Um, there are technology stack that requires multiple languages. Let's say you want to use Ruby on Rails for your back end, and then you want to use uh, Angular on your front end. So you're dealing with JavaScript and Ruby, right? Mean stack is um, one of the benefits of mean stack is you can use just JavaScript along the way, right? Okay. So as you can see in the slide is seeing that, well, programming languages, right? And it, you, you might see that in the front end, it says TypeScript, but that's fine because TypeScript is a um, subset of JavaScript, meaning um, it just inherits a lot of uh, JavaScript and then makes it better. So essentially your TypeScript just compiles to JavaScript. So it's still essentially a JavaScript language, right? Okay, so let's now introduce the Node.js, right? Node.js, uh, Node from the name is like server, right? You can say that it's a server. So it's a server-side um, JavaScript, right? 
So it uses the Google's open source V8 JavaScript engine at its core. And in the browser, when you run your code with the browser, right, it uses also the V8 JavaScript engine. And now you can use that one in your own machine and run it in your uh, command prompt, in your terminal, your shell, right? So again, it brings the V8 JavaScript engine runtime to your local machine environment, right? Uh, it's created in 2009 by Ryan Dahl, right? Um, trivia, right now, the same creator created a new version of Node.js and called it Deno, D-E-N-E-O, and tried to fix a lot of its um, uh, errors of improvement, right? But it's still now in the stages of um, like project base. It's not yet good for enterprise, right? Okay. Again, it's a platform, not a server. Um, even though we call it a server side, it means it's helping us to do server side um, code, right? So it's fast, efficient, scalable, non-blocking, event-driven. You see that non-blocking, event-driven, those are JavaScript uh, concepts, right? Um, using pre-built packages via Node Package Manager, the NPM right, where we have tons of packages slash libraries that we can use so we don't reinvent the wheel. Now, we'll talk about um, single thread and multi, um, single thread and multi-threading, right? Um, we all know we have an operating system. An operating system creates a thread, right? Uh, a process can create, uh, operating system have a process, creates a process and the process can create a thread, right? And a process can as well create multiple threads. As you can see, it's one line of code and these codes are different threads, right? Um, it means that um, this is only doing one set of uh, instructions, right? This can do multiple instructions at a time, okay? So here's an example where let's say you go to a bank and there's two customers and you have also two bank tellers and one bank teller would um, accommodate one customer and the other would accommodate the other customer. And as you can see, they're isolated, right? They don't share resources. One is to one or maybe many, right? Now, um, the single threaded approach would look like this where um, there's a bank teller. So both of them would need to interact with the bank teller and then be redirected to a uh, different bank banking staff like the safe manager and cashier, right? And they need to have this um, communication, right, um, in the center. So there's like a, um, so it doesn't um, affect one another, right? It doesn't block one another, okay? So blocking versus non-blocking. Um, based on the word, when you say blocking, it means if there's a process or let's say instructions, um, let's say series of instruction one, two, three, one has to finish first before two comes in, then it becomes three, and it becomes four. When we say non-blocking, it means that let's say you have one, two, three, four jobs to do, right? Two, if two can execute now, then two would go in or four and one and three. Right, that's a quick example of uh, a non-blocking input-output, right? Um, and that's related to synchronous call and asynchronous call, right? So asynchronous call means, um, let's say you request some data, right? And the server, let's go for the first diagram, a client requests some data and the server would process and gives the response back, right? Sounds simple, but what if let's say you go to a website and you um, requested to view the website, but let's say the size of the navigation bar or menu, the picture is so big, right? It will slow down all the website, right? So here's what we can do, right? Um, we can do a synchronous call with request the data, let's say request for that web page, and try to load or um, respond back the some of the requests that we can process right away, right? So it means that, let's say your navigation menu is a big ass image. Now you can uh, generate other stuff in the web page while still um, 
not waiting but not blocking for that uh, big image right okay um, and then how would we know when to give that back let's say that big data or big image right we use it in the form of callback so it means that I did receive this request and yes uh, after I get it and then I'll give you a response for that one meaning I'll give you that image okay so the single threaded non-blocking event loop so if you combine this together okay single threaded you would think that oh it's single threaded so it might block stuff right because it's a uh, one two three four it's that sequence right but with single threaded and the event loop right what happens here is let's say uh, client sends a series of requests right um, and then now there's this um, event loop where it would check if there are um, uh, unfinished tasks right I think this would be better if we have a queue here on the bottom right so when this client send a request it will make a series of calls and we call that a call stack right and then once we have that um, it can now process calls that can be processed immediately and those that requires something else to do would be thrown to the browser or to the other environment right and then once that um, process is done it doesn't go back right away right it goes to a uh, it queue and then if the queue is the event loop would now check if the call stack is empty then it would go back to the queue and um, let's see a better image for this one to help everyone event loop right <clears throat> so 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 this one would be better yep as I've said um, there those are requests this one is great let's open this quickly right so you have a call stack here so any any calls right it comes to here and let's say the web API or the node API right it will now throw that there right and process that and once it's done it doesn't rep um, give it back right so the call stack if it can give it back right away the call stack can go it, uh, make it respond back to the heap but if not the, it throws it to the web API and the web, pa web API would not throw it back to the call stack but go down first to the queue and the event loop would check if okay is the call stack empty can I add this uh, process that was called if yes then put it back there and the call stack can finish that process and send it back to the heap all right so let's head back here uh, this is an example where you can do a client-side web app and a server-side web app right now it looks the same um, you go to the, your uh, hands-on skills to uh, check the differences on that right um, client side web app you can quickly do that with um, putting in some JavaScript code right um, on the um, front end right in the server in the server side okay so some differences um, Java, JavaScript is not based on Java um, JavaScript uh, kind of piggyback when Java was popular and made it JavaScript so but it's not really related just so you know right and these are the differences you can just look them up right so client-side JavaScript versus server-side JavaScript right um, you have the HTML and embedded JavaScript and also external JavaScript in the web browser right so let's say set timeout you can use the set timeout to call to the web API but if they have node platform as well you can have the set timeout be called by the node platform again because both of them have the v8 javascript engine both of them can execute javascript uh, apis right okay so do your practice and review it should be a hos need to correct that and this one as well to understand the nuances of javascript and also with node as well 
So let's introduce the Express framework, right? We have the Node.js, so why do we need an Express? So uh, Express helps us build our server-side code mm, easier, right? Um, so meaning you have Node.js, you do need Node.js, but you put Express on top of it. So you might be um, wondering there would be times where you have uh, a code base, right, in your server side with Node.js Express, and some of those APIs or uh, methods could be coming from Node.js, and some of them would be coming from Express. Okay, so, so just going back, so if you were Googling, make sure to Google, let's say, a method, and then maybe try Node.js. If it's not, try Express with your Google, right? So it makes easier server setup uh, to handle incoming requests, right? You can route URLs to responses with the router, Express router, okay? Easier to maintain as well. So, and also going back, I think I missed one word. It is an unopinionated web application framework. It means that uh, it doesn't force you to do stuff, meaning it's not going to be a convention over configuration, right? Um, so the good thing about unopinionated, it, it is, it's flexible, right? So again, Express, as we said, it could also provide views, right? Um, it can support uh, many template engines to easily build your HTML page, right? Meaning instead of using HTML uh, language, you can use a template language that renders back to HTML. So the database, uh, we have MongoDB. Um, um, good thing to know about, um, it's a cross-platform document-oriented database program classified as NoSQL database, uses JSON-like documents with optional schemas, right? So um, with NoSQL, it doesn't really require to have a fixed schema, right? Um, you can have, um, you can insert new documents that doesn't satisfy all the existing, let's say, attributes. That's fine, right? And one good thing is it's using JSON-like document. It means that because um, whenever we communicate via API, the data is being passed right now is JSON. It used to be uh, XML but JSON is more lightweight, right? So with MongoDB using JSON-like, so it's a perfect match to do um, API calls, right? And this is just to visualize them, right? Okay, so things to ask, what are the differences? We have mentioned that, right? Let's see. Okay, uh, if you're coming from a relational database background, this would be a refresher. So at the top, you used to seeing this, it looks like an Excel file, right? Um, where in the bottom part is a document. As I mentioned earlier, um, you can have, let's say, another document that says first name Rebecca and no last name. That's fine for NoSQL, right? Um, also, we do have to note that, um, yes, uh, it, MongoDB uses the JSON notation, but it uh, basically it stores it in Bison, right? In binary JSON. But um, we don't really have to um, do anything more extra with Bison, right? So if you have a JSON, you parse it and then you stringify it. So this is one of the way uh, a way to let's say you are receiving uh, a json from the server side and you want your front end to um, understand it then you parse it right or you then stringify it right so one of it is to um, you get a json and you want to parse it so that you can render it the view you do a json parse right if you now have a JavaScript object and you want it to be sent, right? To be sent, now you use the JSON.stringify. Okay, and serialization and deserialization. So it 
just means that you're like packing and unpacking stuff, right? In a stream of bytes. Um, so it has to be ACID compliance, right? For most databases, we should already know this. So um, these are defined already. Um, let's see, embedded schema, embedded sub document. Uh, okay, just so you know, with MongoDB, you can have a document inside a document, so nested, right? You can also um, create relational and um, do normalization, right? Because again, you can associate wherein, let's say, a document is referring to another document with just the ID and not the whole. Uh, key and value right okay so for relational database you are most likely would use an ORM or or use a direct query right a direct uh, statement right or use an ORM so ORM um, what it does is it basically wraps the um, uh, everything in an object right so that you Whenever you query and now it's wrapped in an object, then you can act, do some more stuff easily where you access the object methods, right? The same goes with NoSQL, right? And you can also do a direct query or you can also wrap it with uh, ODM. So in such a way that the query now becomes wrapped in the object and you have access to object methods, which makes it easier to um, create your statements or manipulate. Okay, so if you do have, let's say the application, it needs, uh, let's say Mongoose, right? Mongoose can help you handle connections, schema queries, validation, aggreg aggregation, etc. right? And it becomes an object model. Again, um, Mongoose helps us a lot, but also we can just do application and MongoDB, but that's a harder route and we want to abstract complexity, right? To make it easier for us to build. So that's why we introduced Mongoose. So these are the um, popular frameworks, right? And just so you know that React is more of like a library, right? It's a library, not a framework, right? Vue is lightweight. Um, and you now we have Angular as well, okay? So the traditional page lifecycle, uh, we call it a multi-page application. We don't really say MPA all the time, right? Uh, it's basically when you interact with a page, it refreshes. If you happen to interact with a website where it refreshes the whole page, then you know that it's a multi-page application, right? If you do have, let's say, a page where whenever you interact, it doesn't really refresh the whole page, right? It may be just refreshing that simple component, right? Um, you, you can think of it like um, when you are um, uh, interacting with uh, Amazon um, e-commerce or the Netflix, wherein um, a component can reload by itself, right? One section, right? So the good thing with SPA, if um, a component is not working, a component would not break the whole server right uh, in multi-page application if one thing is not working then it might not work for everything right it means that i view a page and i see nothing or i see an error because because of just one mistake or some some bug there right in spa that could um maybe just hide that there's an error right so pros and cons um SPA is faster UI, um, more interactive, can work offline, especially when you introduce the progressive web application. Uh, UI is just another client, can have BI, perfect for HTML5, bad for SEO, search engine optimization, uh, because there's more uh, different uh, syntax and um, added um, framework uh, writings, so it's harder to for the search engines to find it, right? more complex to build because um, you are using design patterns to build these and also these frameworks uses a lot of libraries as well so uh, developers beware right 
Um, need to expose the application logic to the client. Uh, requires strong JavaScript skills. True, true, true. That but will guide you in this course. Okay. So Angular now is an open source web application developed by Google. Uh, it's using the component based development, right? So just so you know that Angular one and two is totally different from um, uh, two onwards, right? No. So Angular one, sorry, Angular one is totally different from two. Um, and then two started um, using TypeScript as well. They are not compatible. And again, they're totally very different. Okay. So uh, we mentioned that uh, TypeScript, JavaScript, um, both of them are open source uh, language. Uh, TypeScript is developed and maintained by Microsoft. Okay. Um, you can see ES5, ES6, those are uh, different uh, versions of JavaScript or we call it standards, right? Uh, before JavaScript didn't, didn't have like um, the concept, I mean, it doesn't have like object oriented approach, right? Um, but now ES6 uh, does support that object oriented approach, which is helpful as TypeScript also follows that, okay? So component-based development, um, as you can see, you, let's say you have checkout and then card processing instead of just one um, one big logic, you can now dissect it into two components, right? Um, also, you can keep creating templates, right? Um, then the templates can render a template and another template. What I mean by that, let's say a template would render a layout. Then this layout would render maybe a uh, uh, navigation content and footer, right? And it now depends the content. Are you in the about page, right? Then render that component. Are you in the um, contact us page? Then render that component. Are you in the um, product list page? Then we render the product component. Also inside of the product component, we can have a list of products. And in the list of products, we have a product component. So when, sorry, if we move back, let's name it as product page component. In the product page component, let's say we have a uh, list of products. In the list of products, we have a product component. In the product component, we have the description, the uh, name, and the price. So we can basically uh, do that, right? And as far as the supporting cast, right? So Twitter Bootstrap, uh, Bootstrap developed by Twitter, um, it lets us build uh, easy, um, nice designs as well. Um, instead of doing raw HTML, CSS, right? Um, it's going to be harder if you're not uh, a designer. Uh, Bootstrap can give you like a best practice. For example, when you create a button um, and you put primary, it's just going to be blue right away because that's the standard, right? Um, then we need to also learn git for source code management version control so that we can go back to previous version this is the same as when you have let's say a word document in or let's say uh one drive and then you want to revert back to a previous version it's the same thing and this time it's just for the code right um, it also allows uh, developers to collaborate with one another and maybe fix bugs and add features that are not conflicting with one another, right? Okay, next is we have Heroku for deployment as a platform as a service. So platform as a service abstract us from the infrastructure, right? And uh, make it easier for us to just send our code and deploy it, right? Um, and GitHub, um, if you have Git for your local version, uh, local machine version control, GitHub is where you can host that uh, same code and have a Git repository as well, right? So it syncs up with your cloud repository, okay? Um, this one, you can just read about it, um, but we'll be focusing on Heroku, so no need to worry about the other cloud service models. Okay, so introduce the example application, how MeanStack components work together. Right, um, we'll be tackling the textbook application called Locator, right? Um, and then question to ask, are these data real or fake, right? Are they static or dynamic, right? And the lower part is the end product that we want. So 
how does the mean stack components work together, right? Uh, from start for the front end, like, right, for the front end where the user would interact, uh, there's an application, right? And it's in Angular, the language is in TypeScript, right? The data format to be passed is JSON, right? Um, application server, you have Node.js Express, language JavaScript and data format is JSON. Database, we have MongoDB, data format in Bison, and we use also Mongoose, right? And have JSON, right? The arrow that's pointing uh, left to right, it uh, this means that um, someone already requested for a page, right? And the and get some data, right? So that's why it's coming from here, the data retrieval, the data response to the view or to the front end server. Okay, so we now have a high level overview of all the different technologies. If you have any uh, questions, please uh, message me in uh, Microsoft Teams or um, the Blackboard LMS. Okay, and any questions, um, please ask help. And we also have a teaching assistant helping the class. Okay, till next time. Thank you.